Welcome to A Slice of SEL, a podcast for educators about social emotional learning. Welcome to A Slice of SEL. We're the SEL Services team at the St. Croix River Education District. I'm Nick. I'm Rye. And I'm Courtney. And we are in the middle of a five-episode series about integrated SEL instruction. Another way to say that is weaving SEL into our academic instruction throughout the day. And during these episodes, we're going grade band by grade band and talking through a bunch of examples of SEL integrated instruction. And you're hopefully picking up from these episodes some activity ideas for your classroom. But by listening to these episodes, you're also just learning about the Minnesota SEL standards themselves. And they're the foundation of everything we do in SEL. And last week, we covered the first standards area, self-awareness. This week, we're chatting about self-management. And self-management covers really like two buckets of standards and benchmarks. You can kind of break it up into two things. And the first bucket would be like managing emotions, staying calm, showing self-control, impulse control. So there's that bucket, kind of knowing my feelings and being able to manage them and and how they affect my behavior and being able to manage that. The other one is setting goals, persisting, working hard, staying organized. The how we accomplish things bucket is what you might call it. So if you want to think about the standards under self-management, they really split pretty well into those two areas. But before that, let's talk about what's filling our bucket this week. Um, I'll go first. I am just excited that, you know, our routines are starting back up. My girls are going back to school and things are kind of starting to feel somewhat normal, both here at home and um, at work. Well, mine kind of connects to that, Rye. Um, I was in a meeting with a couple teachers earlier this week, and we were talking about um, the elementary schools moving back to having kids in person and how great that is. And teachers were sharing how excited they were and just energized to have kids back in their room. And other teachers were reflecting that as parents and as educators, it really inspired them and made them feel so warm inside to hear their colleagues, other teachers, talk about how much energy and excitement they have of having the kids back. Because they, they as parents, really appreciate hearing that. Like, the, the, kid, the teachers who are working with my kids are probably just as excited to have my kids back in their classroom. So it just feels really good to a lot of people. Yeah, it's been really fun just seeing um, the girls come home with like all the stuff from their teachers and and how happy the teachers were to see them just like you said. Right. That's awesome. Um, And I'll go last. We are getting a new car in our household. So it's really exciting. We'll be able to have two reliable and attractive, fun to drive vehicles. That's very exciting. You, that's one of those things that's easy to take for granted until you have car trouble. So shifting to our main topic, in the first episode last week, we did about integrated SEL instruction. That's episode 14, if you want to jump back and listen to it. We explained the difference between integrated SEL instruction and explicit SEL instruction. So we encourage you to go back if you missed that episode and listen, because we'll explain it a little bit more there than we will this week. We also want to just remind you that these aren't competing practices. So it's not like, oh, I'm teaching SEL curriculum like a second step or using our Be Good People curriculum. So no need to try to weave that learning into the rest of the day. We also wanted to review briefly what this actually looks like in practice. So some of these activities that we're going to talk about are going to fit nicely into an academic lesson plan. And you could, for example, add an SEL learning target to an academic lesson plan and actually include a discussion, an art, a writing activity that blends that SEL learning in without the students even real, even realizing it. And some of the activities we cover won't fit that model exactly, and you'll get the idea as you listen to the examples we talk about. For example, like last week, we talked about encouraging students to join clubs or other activities. I wouldn't really write that probably into a lesson plan for my math lesson, for example. So you get the idea. Some of these things are going to really fit and be nested into those academic lesson plans, and some of them are more ways we weave it in throughout the day, but we aren't necessarily writing it into a lesson plan. Right, and we also want to just mention that these activities came straight from the Minnesota State SEL standards. So fortunately, our state standards included a bunch of integration examples to get the schools rolling, so we didn't have to come up with all of it from scratch. 
So let's get started. Well, we're going to run through some examples by grade band starting with K3. So just a little tip, if you don't teach K3, I just suggest you look at the time codes in your podcast app and skip ahead a little bit. So our first example for K through three, the benchmark is recognize that they, the students, have choices in their behaviors. And an activity you could use to blend this in during ELA, read a story and discuss where the students would make different choices than a character and what the effects of those choices would be on the story. And for example, like if we're reading a story about a polar bear, it might be pausing after we finish the story. Hey, you know, the polar bear had a big feeling. He took a break in the story. When we have big feelings, sometimes we want to shout. What if the polar bear had shouted at the Norwal? What do you think would have happened? So just talking through, like, when you have these emotions, they are going to make you more likely to do certain things. And what would have happened if the the polar bear would have made a different choice? The next one is identify personal goals with assistance from an adult. An activity for this one is have students create a personal goal, hope, or dream for the school year and display them in the classroom along with the steps they will need to take to reach it. Um, The elementary educator in me is just flowing with cute classroom ideas for this one. Um, But right away, obviously, a good time for this lesson is at the beginning of a school year or around the new year when we're creating resolutions. But it is also equally important to revisit throughout the year. So if you're teaching an English or a reading class, maybe it's a goal that the students want to read a certain amount of books. Or you're teaching a health or a FIAD class and you're having students make a health or physical fitness related goal. Um, I know my daughter, we just sat down and and made a dance goal. She's an avid dancer and she wanted... um, to meet a certain goal. So I help guide her through that process with making a plan with a reasonable timeline to help her reach the goal. But I also emphasize the importance of having her to be her to be the one to come up with the steps that she wants to take because if it were me or anyone else telling her what to do, she would not be as meaningful to her. Yeah, that's a great personal example. Um, And the next benchmark we're going to chat about is recognize the importance of not giving up or another way to say that is perseverance. And an activity example is to routinely ask students to brainstorm ways to motivate themselves when they face a difficult situation. And just for example, say that you're starting a new math unit or a new unit in any subject. And during your anticipatory set, some teachers might present that as a challenge. Like, oh boy, this unit's a tough one. You guys are going to have to bring your grit in spades to get through this unit. Um, Does anybody have any ideas for how we can keep working hard, even if one of us feels like giving up? So that could be built in as the anticipatory set when you're doing the first lesson in a new unit. This next example is the same benchmark that Nick just said, that perseverance. Um, Read a biographical story about a historical figure or leaders that don't give up. Talk about how their perseverance paid off for themselves and for their communities. So an example for this one, um, if W.E.B. Du Bois is covered in social studies class, It could do a think, pair, share, or another discussion technique. Why do you think he was able to do X, Y, Z? And then during the whole group sharing, guide them to focus on the perspective and not intelligence. So we're going to move on to the four through five grade band. And the first benchmark in this area is to understand causes and effects of their emotions, thoughts, impulses, stress, and distress. So an activity here would be to read a story that demonstrates an internal conflict within a character and students identify cause and effect of that conflict within a character. So for example, Buzz Lightyear in Toy Story thinks he's an action hero, not a toy. He keeps getting information that proves that he is a toy. So the effect example would be, how does this conflict make him feel? We could use the Yale mood meter or give kids a simple emotion vocabulary list. Also, What does the conflict in Buzz's feelings make him want to do? His impulses? So examples, he keeps looking for dangerous situations where he can prove that he is not a toy. And for the record, pulling back the curtain, um, we came up with the Toy Story example because I looked up a list of four through five reading texts and couldn't quickly uh, think of great internal conflicts to use as an example. So um, (laughs) you might not be watching Toy Story in class, but it is a good example of internal (laughs) conflict. The next one is use constructive ways of expressing their emotions, thoughts, impulses, and stress, such as through using I statements. An activity for this is use fill-in-the-blank I statements as a practice practice tool. For example, I feel nervous or distracted when the music is so loud. I just think that this activity can also help build communication and self-advocacy skills. 
I know some adults who aren't even able to express how others make them feel and communicate what they need in order to help them feel better in the relationships without bottling everything up until it overflows, you know, like that soda pop had last, last week's episode. Um, so just a good way is just to encourage your students to be open and vulnerable with each other throughout your class as it pertains to student discussions, assignments, or interactions. Yeah, and when I was thinking about this one, Rai, um, I like the example of discussions because I was thinking about how you would write this into a lesson plan and where it would fit. Like you could, before splitting kids into small groups, um, have them fill in that blank of I feel blank when I'm in a small group and I end up doing most of the work, for example, <laughs> um, and give them an opportunity to ahead of time proactively express that so that they head into that activity um, with more vulnerability and understanding of how it's going to go. So the next benchmark we're going to chat about is identify internal and external resources necessary to overcome obstacles to meet a goal. And as a regular, this is an activity example, as a regular practice, anytime students are working on goals, you could ask them questions that help them think about the resources they can use. Like, what are the challenges you're facing to achieve your goal? And what kinds of resources could you use to overcome an obstacle? So those kind of reflective questions for students. So to make this really concrete, for example, say that I'm a student and I'm completing a group project or just a project individually by myself. At the beginning of the project, midway through, a couple of times, you could have students do a think-pair-share on those questions that I just read. So your goal is to create a great project, for example. What challenges are you facing? Have them think-pair-share about that. And then next question, what kind of resources could you use to overcome obstacles? And then they're getting that feedback from each other and those ideas from each other, and it isn't all coming from me as the teacher. The next one is demonstrate the ability to actively engage in a feedback loop. So building in time for reflection at the end of each day or week when students reflect on their plans or goals and assess whether they are making progress and think about what they may want to do to improve. So maybe they made a student goal of reading a certain number of books. So just checking in on their progress and making sure that the students are on track. We actually did something like this uh, just this week at SCRED with some of our personal professional goals um, that we make at the beginning of each year. I just think it's so helpful to take out the goals and plans and visit them frequently in order to keep them on the forefront. It just allows us to adjust and pivot those plans as needed so that we all stay on track and, and you can help your students make those goals that they set for themselves. And I think that reading example is really excellent, Rai, because it's just an, an example of how this SEL integration doesn't have to like feel dramatically different from what we already might have been doing. Like, I think that's a pretty common thing to, to check in. I'm part of the generation that earned pizzas from Pizza Hut for reading a certain number of books. So that was my goal when I was a kid. Um, actually, that's still a practice. Is it? <laughs> yeah. The girls oh, uh, bring home the Pizza Hut slips every week or every month. <laughs> Um, the next benchmark uh, is analyze the relationship between your own ethical values, such as honesty, respect, integrity, and your behavior or the choices that you're going to make. So an example of where this could fit in social studies class is reading biographies or the short stories about historical figures that sometimes come in, in the history textbook itself, focusing on historical figures that demonstrate highly ethical values. Um, and then you would lead a discussion about how those values influence their actions. So just for example, say you're talking about George Washington. You could provide students with a list of value words. You could just write them on the smart board, for example, and let students pick one. And you could just have them all look at the smart board during a whole group discussion and just let them pick one that's there. You could have them split into think pair shares and each, you know, pick a word and talk about it. But anyway, just let them discuss and reflect and make that connection. How did that value that they think George Washington had affect his choices and the behavior that he engaged in in the situation you're reading about? So again, an example of where you might think to do this already. Okay, shifting to six through eight, our middle schoolers. So the first benchmark we're going to talk about is evaluate the role that attitudes play in being successful. And just an example of an activity that could help weave and blend this in is share your own story about a time when your attitude, either as a student or as a teacher, affected you. And just a really concrete example, so when you're preparing students to do an individual speech or a group speech, 
you could plan to share a story about the first time you had to do this when you were a student and how your attitude affected you in a positive or a negative way. Or you could talk about presenting in front of your fellow teachers and your students might react with like, wow, you actually talk to the other teachers when we're not here. <laughs> um, and just share that, yeah, your attitude about that can affect you in a positive or a negative way. So you could write that in and plan to do it as part of your lesson about speeches. That's so relatable. <laughs> uh, my benchmark is the same one. So evaluating the role um, attitudes play in being successful. Um, another activity is just provide authentic feedback when you notice students showing a positive attitude. For example, I know this math problem is challenging, but I like your attitude. You're really sticking with, with it and you're not getting discouraged. Everyone likes to receive feedback um, and it's even more valuable when to the student when the feedback is authentic. So that specific example reminds me of an earlier podcast where we talked about praise and how important it is to praise effort and not intelligence. Uh, you can embed this feedback anytime into, into your class, whether it's before, during, or when you're returning assignments. The next benchmark is demonstrate the ability to filter feedback from adults and peers. So an activity would be during a group experiment or a writing project, ask students to ask adults and peers for feedback. Um, ask the students to work in small groups to review the feedback and then decide what feedback is helpful. Um, I would probably use this in an ELA class when working on those um, bigger writing assignments. It's important to do peer reviews anyways, and then also having an adult review the work and adding the group review of the feedback um, can not only help students decide what's helpful for their paper or to change, um, but also what they can do to provide more helpful feedback when they're doing the reviews themselves. Such a relatable example and one we all encountered as students, I, I imagine, and one you've done as a teacher court. Um, and Absolutely. just a great example of how you're probably already doing this, right? Peer right. reviews are really common. Um, another benchmark for our middle school kiddos is demonstrate the ability to balance and prioritize multiple goals. So an activity example have a group writing project or a science project and provide students with practice in balancing and prioritizing multiple goals that are associated and linked with that project. So again, keeping with this theme of things that you're probably already doing, <laughs> I think it's safe to say that most of the teachers listening to this podcast are probably doing group projects at some point for the middle schoolers. And projects tend to have multiple deadlines that you have to balance and prioritize. And just an example of, you know, like I was just saying, this is a natural thing that's probably already happening. You could reflect on what you're doing to support their success with those multiple deadlines. So, for example, like providing a graphic organizer for the project, another kind of organizational support, like having them complete a calendar together as a group. Um, you could suggest roles for them, like when they meet as a group in the classroom, you could make the facilitator, the note taker, the action planner kind of thing. And that can be a good way to support them and make sure that it's a successful experience with balancing those goals and practicing group work in general. Because again, those are kind of transferable skills that are going to benefit those kids well beyond the time when they finish that particular project. So shifting to our high schoolers, grade band 9 through 12, one benchmark we're going to chat about is practice strategies for recognizing and coping with complex emotions, such as rejection, social isolation, and other forms of stress or distress. And an activity of how this could be blended into ELA, for example, highlight complicated emotions when they naturally are occurring in literature texts that you're reading. So you could have students journal or complete a worksheet to reflect on how they might deal with the same complex emotions that the characters are dealing with in the text. So we talked about last week in our episode about self-awareness, um, ways that when you're reading text, you can provide like the Yale mood meter, which is just a visual that has a lot of emotional vocabulary words on it. Or you could give kids just a bullet pointed list of emotional vocabulary words. So that helps them just build up their emotional vocabulary. Like what do you think that the character is feeling and letting them select some of those vocab words. That's pretty simple. So whether or not you give them a visual like that, one question on a worksheet you put in front of them could just be that. Identify one or more emotions that this character is feeling. And a follow up long answer or a paragraph question on that worksheet could be, how would you deal with those emotions if you were in the same position? And what would your choices lead to? So it's a question that I think I answered a couple times running through high school reading literature texts. 
Um, and it's a great way to blend this in. The next one is incorporate personal management skills on a daily basis, including work study skills, personal resources, and time management. So an activity for this is students creating a daily plan for mapping out school, activities, homework, and sleep or nutrition. Um, I just remember my high school gave out student planners at the beginning of every year and early on in the year we had lessons about how to use it and keep organized. And then I remember like my teachers whenever they would assign us assign um, homework or projects like they really advocated us using our planner to help model and, and teach those uh, organization skills. And I think schools, especially when they do explicit instruction, like I'm working with a junior and senior high school right now where during distance learning, they made sure that they were teaching their lesson in their SEL curriculum about organizational skills. And they were talking about to-do lists and calendars and planners, right? And making sure that the kids had like a system. Because we often, I think, assume that by the time kids hit ninth grade, like they've got that stuff figured out. But I worked in a high school, you just wouldn't probably believe the ratio of students and the number of students who don't have those skills. And it's like, maybe their hand was being held up until they got to that point. And then suddenly we expect them to just pick up all that slack and be able to keep track of all that stuff. I don't remember really being explicitly taught how to use a planner until I did get to high school. So I do think it is important for especially those middle school teachers out there to really maybe start focusing on that earlier because there is such a difference between middle school and high school and the responsibilities that are placed on you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And again, with this episode and thinking about in particular ways that you can integrate this planfully and intentionally, like write this stuff into lesson plans, you could write, for example, before you're going into a multi-step project, writing into your lesson plan to remind students and give them time to think about how they're going to keep track of this with their organizational system, because it's really about applying that knowledge that they've learned into day-to-day life. Exactly. The next one is analyze if they are behaving in line with the ethical values and adjust accordingly. So an activity for this is to teach the think process to help students recognize responsible social media use before posting an unkind or untrue remark about a person because they are upset. So the think process is an acronym. It stands for T is, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? And K, is it kind? Um, This activity could easily be part of the class norms as well. And Court, this one always makes me think of you because when you first moved into our office at Scred, you had a sign like this in your area. And it was one of those first signs that I knew we would work so well together. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I do think it is such a valuable thing to teach to students and because it's easy to remember and can help slow down some of those students who might be quick to speak. Um, And you could easily revisit this process before the start of any large group discussion, either virtually or in person. This was one of those things that I had in my classroom before our school became a PBIS school. So we didn't have those like five school-wide things that we use. So whenever I would have to have those behavioral redirects with my kids, I would say, all right, look at the sign. Where do we think we struggled today? Where do we think that comment fell? (laughs) And then how can we fix it? Oh, I I love love that that reflection. Yeah, great example. Um, The next benchmark we're going to talk about is analyze and implement feedback from multiple sources like peers, teachers, family. And an activity example of this is you're going to be doing large group projects, right? So asking students to rotate around in groups and give each other feedback and ask them to collect that feedback from each other and then as a group discuss and organize the feedback and decide what to do with it. And when you hear that example, you might be thinking, um, I do peer review and I'm already doing this. And that's, again, kind of a theme of this episode is that you're probably recognizing some activities that you are already doing. So you're already doing a lot of social emotional learning in these ways. And another thing to think about here is what am I doing to help support this and make sure that it's a successful exercise for students. So just for example, kind of that link between explicit and integrated instruction. On the explicit side, I know our Be Good People curriculum, it's an SEL curriculum, has a lesson about accepting feedback. And one of the things we have in there is just a one sheet poster that has the steps to accepting feedback. So if I, say, taught that lesson earlier in the year, it would be really a great idea to bring out that poster and just take a minute to review what that looks like to remind kids, hey, before we do peer review, let's review what it should look like to accept feedback in an appropriate way. And one of the things 
I think in that high school lesson is you don't necessarily have to accept it because not all the feedback you will get is stuff that you have to act on. Um, the next benchmark we're going to chat about is develop both medium and longer term goals by the end of the school year or in six months. So those are examples of like medium long term goals. And an activity example is to create small groups designed to help students think about the steps needed to complete an assignment. So if you think about like a assignment that takes more than a day, like a project assignment, some steps are like doing research, gathering information, outlining an essay or a report actually drafting it, proofing it, right? Those steps. And students have all kinds of systems for this. Like they might be using a planner, they might be using a to-do list app. So to make it really concrete, imagine you've got a project to do in two weeks and it's an individual project. Well, you could begin it by pairing students up or putting them in small groups and giving them time to coach each other so they can walk each other through what are the steps of this longer term project. How are you planning to keep track of when you get done with them? What's your system? And then they can learn from each other. And we all know adolescents are more likely to take each other's advice than the adult's advice. <laughs> um, and we talked about this earlier. A lot of kids hit ninth grade without the organizational, basic organizational skills that we might anticipate. I've worked with a lot of high schoolers in 10th or, or 11th grade who still don't have those basic systems for keeping track of what they have to do when it's due and a way to check it off. So it's a great opportunity to have them reinforcing that behavior and learning from each other. And the last benchmark we've got today is monitor progress toward medium and longer term goals and make adjustments to plan as needed. So an activity for this one could take place during a math or science class where graphing is being covered. Um, can have students identify an academic, personal, athletic, or whatever goal and help them use that uh, help them use that to practice graphing skills. So I remember the high school I worked at, the health class would set goals um, for that class, and they usually worked on improving their eating habits or sleeping habits, and they would track them and then graph them. And at the end of the term, they would present their graphs and their data and results and what they found from that project to the whole class. Um, within the larger long-term goals, they would also set benchmarks to review around midterm, and that would help them see where they were, and then also how those smaller goals fit into those big ones and how they can adjust. Oh, it's such a good example, Court. Thank you. Oh, of course. So let's talk takeaways. We talked about at the beginning of the episode, there's two hopeful, hopefully outcomes you have from listening to this episode and this series. One is just picking up some fun activity examples. That's always nice. Tools of the trade. Number two would just be learning about these five areas, um, the standards and benchmark areas. So self-awareness was last week. This week it's self-management. Next week we'll be talking about social awareness, then relationship skills, and then finally responsible decision making. And just to recap, we've said this in I think other episodes, in other videos, but I wanted to make it clear. Um, this podcast is for our local folks, and in most of our schools, PBIS is in place. And it's really un important to understand the relationships between SEL and PBIS. They're not competing. If you're in a PBIS school, you know you've got three to five expectations or rules, like safe, respectful, responsible. And those are ways to make it easier to communicate where the bar is for kids, what our rules are. SEL helps kids meet that bar. So if you think of a rule that we might have is like walk slowly in the hallway, well, in order to do that, a kid has to be self-aware about their feelings, their behavior, their impulses, and then they have to use self-management to control that. So that's just an example of like these skills that we're building through SEL are the things we need kids to know in order to meet our rules and our behavior expectations. So with that being said... Self-management, again, falls into kind of two areas. This is a big takeaway. One is that bucket where it's understanding and managing our emotions, showing self-control over our impulses. The other half, the other bucket, is being able to set goals, being able to persist when we struggle, and stay organized, just getting stuff done, basically. And learning those two things, managing our emotions and our impulses and getting stuff done, Learning those skills doesn't have to only happen when we're teaching our SEL curriculum. We can weave that into the whole school day. And hopefully another takeaway is that you're probably already doing quite a bit of this. <laughs>
So stay tuned for next week's episode. We're going to cover social awareness. Can't wait. Me neither. Thanks for spending time with us today. Make sure to subscribe. And if you're on YouTube, click the bell so that you're notified when new episodes are released each week. We'll see you when you come back for another slice of SEL. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.